Hi, I'm Stephen from Chowney. Um, I'm here with uh, Tony Butler, who we are, we've just done a new base for, uh, the Retrovibe uh, Tony Butler Signature Vantage. <laughs> Something. Fine. Um, so, the first thing I really want to know um, is you you kind of turned up out of the blue um, to, to talk to us about mm. um, coming to look at our bases and stuff. So, where did you hear about us? Um, I've been, I've gone through a bit of a crusade because um, um, unfortunately in 2000, um, Big Country lost Stuart Adamson. He um, unfortunately uh, um, took his life and then I had to sort of think about what to do with my life and then I decided to put something back and I was always in interested in teaching so I kind of went back to to, to college and to, to university and got my teaching degree and then st running a course at a, a college in North Devon and throughout the years I was head of music and throughout the years I was always faced with students who couldn't afford instruments and right. you know and the the obvious sort of outlet was to go to mum and dad and say please can I have this I need this for my coursework you know it's like having to put out get, uh, apply for a second mortgage and I had it from that point which you know a good 10 years ago there must be good instruments out there that don't cost at that much, you know, or at least are reasonably good at that price. So I sort of started to keep a lookout whilst I was teaching. But um, after I left the college in 2016, I kind of really sort of branched out more with that crusade to find out who's out there. Because I, I lost a lot of touch with certain areas of music, as one does, because I live in deepest, darkest Cornwall, and you lose contact with a lot of things. And... Um, but I always had this idea to find find people who make great instruments for something that you know the common person could afford or the common student could afford. And I started asking around and sort of looking around and, and the best person to ask are students because they're the ones who need it. And I had a student who uh, heard about you. Okay. And uh, I kind of looked you up and sort of looked and I sort of, well, what struck me first was your prices. It's quite funny because I'd always assumed that you had found us through Scott Whitley, but actually you found us. I'd found us before, yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, Scott, Scott, I think compounded uh, the work. Well, seeing Scott made me want to come and approach you. Oh, okay. I'd heard of you through students before. I heard about another guitar company through students, but uh, at that time I, I sort of wasn't pro probably in the right sort of place because of my unfortunate injuries. Uh, to, to actually action it, but when I saw Scott, I, I've never, I'd never met Scott at that time. Um, Scott being the bass player in Big Country, which was just a weird phenomenon for me as it is anyway. <laughs> yeah. And um, but I noticed that he had an association with you as well. Yeah. So that's when I really researched you on online and stuff, and I saw saw your instruments and the quality of your instruments looked fantastic. The fact that Scott seems to be, be in with you to the point where you have looked at his his um endorsement with the, his ideas for a guitar because i believe you kind yeah of... it was, we kind of came a bit backwards yeah. with, with scott he was with the animals when he first met us and he'd had the idea for a guitar mm -hmm. and he'd taken it to other manufacturers and no one was really interested so right. we kind of helped him get started manufacturing himself and then yeah. when he started playing with big country he didn't have time to to put guitars That's... in boxes anymore yeah and i'm great at putting guitars in boxes so <laughs> um uh, he 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 kind of brought it into us. Yeah. Um, but what impressed me was the fact that you could come up with a quality instrument for the price that you're charging. Now, to me, that says a lot. To me, that's that's you know what a risk it is for the individual to be doing that anyway. And I kind of always thought that people in my position could be of help in you know letting people know that you've got stuff that is available. There's, you don't have to get a second mortgage if you buy. It's something you can go out and gig with professionally, you can use on a college course. You know, it it's just starts you off if you want to have something decent uh, as, a, as an intermediate or a, a learner or a beginner. And, and it's, price is obviously the most important thing, but it's also attitude. And you've got the kind of attitude since I've known you that says, I'm really happy to help this person regardless because I, I like... I think the word is ethos. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, uh, most of the credit for your particular base goes um, <laughs> to uh, David uh, Koenig from um, uh, Retrovibe, who mm. 
Scott and uh, the, David from Retrovibe and, and us were all manufacturing at the same factory in, yeah. when we were all manufacturing in China. So mm -hmm. it started to make sense for us to ship our products together. Yeah. So for some reason, I became the hub for that. Right. And then gradually, uh, he wanted to focus on other things and we've taken over manufacturing some of his instruments. Yeah. So uh, we do, you know, the... Vantage and the Volante and mm -hmm. um, the Evos. So, well, I I I looked at your catalogue and um, when it was kind of coming to, to approach you about a, a signature, the the Volante, oh the the, the Volante was looks lovely and I kind of thought that's nice, but I kind of thought myself that I would be using that bass playing with my fingers, which I don't always do. I kind of use finger play um, either with in sessions when I was a session musician. But I'm a pick player. I'm a, I'm yeah. a bass guitarist, and the Vantage to me shouted yeah. guitarist, bass guitarist. You're the four strings at the bottom of a guitar band, and in terms of big country. But what impressed me the first time is the low end. I also canvas. think, um, yeah, because you were a P bass player yeah. uh, and a and a Rickenbacker player. Yeah. Um, that maybe it's because it's got a P profile neck. <laughs> What I love about this is that it feels like, apart from the signature, it feels like you thought of me. Because this really feels ultra comfortable. It doesn't feel like something that I've never known before. I, I feel totally comfortable. This one, this just, there's nothing I want to do to change it in order for me to work with it. It just feels natural. The shape I've described as what I'm used to in terms of my bass guitar, you know, the sort of, the the ones that I've got when I was younger, the P bass and the Rickenbacker, but this is a brilliant child of between mm. the two of them. It it it, it marks out every all the attributes that those two guitars turned into this one is fantastic, and it feels at home. Did you ever use the Rickenbacker for any big country stuff? No. I've noticed that you you've got a video on YouTube that clearly you'd done later with the with the guys oh, from Big B Country BBW, and yeah. uh, you were playing a Ricky in that. Well, I've, I've I got the Ricky when I, it's a, actually if you got the time, it's a nice little story. Well, let's, I'll tell you what. Let's let's we'll talk about your guitars. Yeah. Let's make sure doubly doubly sure that's recording, and then I will just say hello and yeah. we we can go from there. My my mother when I was starting off. Um, Bless her soul. She 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 wanted to sort of help me do what I want to do. Um, she's a lovely West Indian lady, and you know, <laughs> been in England and bringing up a child over here. But when I expressed an interest in music, you know, I, I kind of would read the magazines and look at all the, the big shops and look at the P basses and look at the Rickenbackers and look at the Fender guitars. And uh, when it came to me having a guitar, because she said, you know, I'll get you a guitar this Christmas. What would you like? So I'm looking at the things and I see Rickenbackers, you know, and then I'd look at the price and thought, I won't, I, don't, I won't mention that to my mum. And I found a Rickenbacker copy and it, it was like something like three quarters of the price of an original yeah. one. So uh, she took me with her to the, go to the bank to, to, to go and see if I can get a loan for this thing. You know, I was only about sort of 13, 14. And... Uh, she said, well, my son wants to buy a guitar. And he said, what would you like? And I said, well, I'm looking for a guitar. It's, it's, it's a Rickenbacker copy. And uh, he says, what's Rickenbacker? And I said, well, this is a big make. You know, it's fantastic. <laughs> you know, there's lots of, lots of big pop stars use it. And uh, he said, how much is that? And I said, well, it's about 400 quid or something. And he said, how much is, have you come to borrow? I said, well, the one I've got is like 96 pounds. He gave me 400 quid to go and get, and he gave it what percent nice and that's how i started and that bass is with me today that's my heirloom that's gonna we'll leave with that but that that signified to me that if you get if that you got the support it's there if you want it yeah and it really changed me as a person because i just thought it was unbelievable and to give my mum no not percent finance it's fantastic. It's amazing. So that's my Rickenbacker. The, the most amazing part about that story is that there was a time when a Rickenbacker only cost 400, 400 quid. quid. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> that shows you how old I am. But um, to answer your question, um, no, I never, the Rickenbacker wasn't, wasn't a big country sounding bass. No. It was too light at the bottom end. 
and because I used to, I loved the trebly side of a Rickenbacker, but the band needed some low end. And um, when I got the P bass, I literally, I was just, I started off with Aria and um, I started um, recording with Aria and I didn't like it. So one day we, 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 were, we were recording at um, Air Studios, which used to be in Regent Street. So we popped down to Shaftesbury Avenue and picked a P bass off the shelf. Okay. And I took it into the studio and we started recording the ill-fated first version of the, the, uh, the band's uh, first album because that, uh, that part of that album never got released. It got ditched because it wasn't very good. So was, did that P bass have a mirror scratch plate on it? Not at the time. You added that later? No, I did that later because I was a huge fan of uh, Phil Lynott. Okay. And, uh, you know, everything about him, you know, don't take this in the wrong way, but rock and roll is about sex, sexiness and all that sort of And Phil Lynott, to me, was a sexy guy and his bass was sexy, you know, black with a mirrored front and it, it was just unbelievably cool. And then I kind of looked at my bass, and it was really nice and standard, and it sounded great. But I thought, no, I've got to do the chrome. So who made the crook scratch plate for you? Um, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just turned out one day. We had a great crew at the time, you know, and when Big Country started touring, you know, we, we, we got what we wanted. And so and I just thought it would be a great image to have. So the the it was a mirror to start off with and it got cracked I believe so we went to chrome okay. but, um, and the chrome is on it to this day but it's extremely tarnished and stuff like that I did prefer the mirror because on stage I've got a great thing about wanting to look good on stage everything looking and sounding good and I thought a mirror looks brilliant on stage yeah. especially when you reflect it on punters at the front you know they love it and it's, it's just part of the atmosphere because <laughs> yeah. that's important as, as important as the music for me cool I'm really looking forward to getting this into my studio to really give it its paces. But I already know that if I was in a position to go out and play live, this would be the uh, guitar of choice first out of the bag. Excellent. Um, so I know it seems a very obvious question, but mm. what made you pick bass guitar over other <laughs> instruments to focus your attention on? It's very simple. I got into Jimi Hendrix and I thought I'd never ever be as good as him. So I'll try something where I've got... A an opportunity to make a name for myself okay so, so uh you know it's not a, a, a bass guitar always attracted me in fact my first attraction was very clearly when i was about eight ten years old watching top of the pops and there was a, a close-up of a p bass uh by a band um norman greenbaum i forget the song but it was on top of the pops, and there was a real close-up of, of the Fender bass. And I saw that, and that was my destiny. Spirit in the Sky. Spirit in the Sky, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just, I, I went and told my, te my teacher at school the next day, he said, look, I saw this bass guitar, on, 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 <laughs> and I really want it. And he said, well, they're very expensive, but um, they'll try and get something. So they got something for me to use in my school course. So that was fantastic. That was, okay. And it was, wasn't very good, but... It was my starting point, and also my my cousin, who was in the army, who was based in Germany, um, he knew a guy who made guitars as as just a bit of a hobby. So he made me this bass guitar, had a proper wooden neck, but the body was made out of paper mache. <laughs> so you, <laughs> anything wet went on it would just disintegrate. And it played all right. Yeah, it played all right until it was, I was only left with a neck because <laughs> <laughs> it had just completely disintegrated. But that's that was my humble starting. But okay. the bass was an attraction, and I, 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 I'm attracted to things like that, which want, I, I want to engage with. So that's where the bass guitar bit came in. I mean, I've been a closet guitarist all my life which is why I consider myself a bass guitarist rather than a bass player. I've always been interested in the lead part of melody and the, the rhythmic part of melody that comes from a guitar. But if I can incorporate that into the bass, then you know, that suits me fine, which is why Big Country were the obvious band for me to, to get into. Yeah, OK. So you do play the guitar as well? Yes. And uh, on your new album, yeah. um, you play... The I, bass and the guitar. I play bass and all the guitar and all the vocals. The only thing I can't do is drums. Okay. I don't have the mentality. <laughs> and I'm being polite. <laughs> oh, okay. I, funnily enough, I only chose the bass guitar because I thought I had to learn to play a musical instrument. And I thought, what's easy? I'll play the bass. There's no chords. 
I was wrong. Well, you're wrong. Yeah, this <laughs> but, is a cool. But that was the reasoning, and then yeah. <laughs> within a few years, I was doing this. But it doesn't matter how you start. It's when you start. It's how you engage with it and, and what you want to do with it, which I think is the, the, the fantastic thing about uh, music. It's it can be liberating in all sorts of ways and. However you want to engage in it, the only difficulty is if you start asking people for money for what you want to do, and that's. Um, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> um, so uh, then, you. How did you come to be um, in big country? Okay, so um, my formative career in music emanated around a house in um, Ealing Common. Uh, the people's house was called the Townsends. Now, um, I was a very good friend and in the same band with Simon Townsend, who's Pete Townsend's younger brother. Okay. And uh, we had uh, our own band and with various names um, from time to time. And uh, it was just a lovely bunch of people. I met Pete, who I didn't really know who he was at the time. And, uh, you know, he just was like this old man playing guitar quite badly. <laughs> and I didn't know I didn't know who he was until I I saw Woodstock and I thought oh my god that's my mate's yeah, my mate's brother, uh, so we our band went on until I was about sort of fifteen sixteen and then myself and Mark the drummer we decided that you know we we could make a little living for ourselves as a rhythm section sort of the Sly and Robbie of of Soho <laughs> Fair enough. and we did you know we we got a lot of gigs and did a lot of sessions and. Um, we got a call from Ian Grant, who was Big Country's manager at the time, asking us if we would come and do a, a um, do a demo with a band that he's just started managing, and that's when I first met uh, Stuart Adamson. So, what band was he in at the time? Stuart was in a band called the Skids right. before, yeah, and uh, him with Richard Jobson. And when the Skids uh, was split up. In actual fact, I met, did meet Stuart before because my band with Simon Townsend and Mark, we were called On The Air, and we supported the skids. And um, okay. that's a kind of, I say, I didn't really meet Stuart. He was kind of very shy and quiet guy. I didn't see much of him. But uh, when it was put to us, you know, would you like to come and you know, be involved with Stuart Adams? And I thought, yes, please, straight away. You know, because I loved his guitar playing. I, liked, I loved his style. I kind of really liked the skids as, uh, and their, their songs. And um, so meeting up with Stuart, and uh, the only sort of person I didn't really know anything about was this other little guy called Bruce, Bruce Watson, who was Stuart's sidekick on guitar. And we did our first session at the Phonogram Studios in, in London. And uh, bizarrely, the, guy, the engineer who was um, producing, recording that, was the guy who ended up being, um, oh, I'm going to trip up here now, Stereophonics Manager. Okay. And it's, it's weird how sort of the, the rock tree kind of sprouts yeah, yeah. in these weird directions. It's quite a small world yeah. sometimes as well. But um, we did this demo with um, this guy um, recording us, and uh, halfway through the demo, a guy called Br Chris Briggs, who's A&R uh, at, at Phonogram at the time, came down to the studio, heard what he heard, took Ian out of the, of the room, came back, Ian said, you guys got a deal. Oh, this is quick. <laughs> and uh, it's like, no, that was it. You know, we were signed to Phonogram at that point, and then we went on to, I say, we first started making the first album with a guy called Chris Thomas, who produced Pete Townsend's album, which is why I think he got to work with us at the time. Uh, but we then, that album was scrapped, and we went on to make an album with Steve Lillywhite, which turned out to be The Crossing, and uh, Big Country was away. Okay. So I was still living in South Africa when Big Country was around. Oh, really? And, yeah, um, yeah it, it was quite difficult to get hold of. Mm. Um, and we had like local pressings, which weren't very good. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. of, of all the LPs and stuff. Bizarrely, we've, we've had a hit in South Africa. I, don't, I can't remember what track it was, but it was probably a... You were pretty big in South yeah. Africa. Yeah, that's yeah. That's, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. but I've I've been here for quite a long time. Yeah. So, um, I think, yeah. Well, I think that's that's enough. No, uh, that's I'll let fine. you get on your way. No. Um, it's a it's a it's a real pleasure to meet uh, entrepreneurs like yourself. I mean, obviously having a love of of an instrument and sort of using that uh, enthusiasm as a business. 
as I say, me endorsing something is about me endorsing the person as well as the product. And I like what you're doing and I really hope you become successful in it because a lot of kids out there are going to be are going to benefit from this and uh, and that's my main mission and I'm not interested in you know any anything apart from getting the word out you know I hope that people will see this base and want to go and get engaged with it because you're not going to see this one it's going to be in my studio locked away with me working on a new album working on a new album okay um and you you've just had an album out but yeah my time unfortunately my the i've not been able to sort of work that album as much as i'd like to because of my medical problems yeah but people can still find it online or on amazon I'm on assuming. amazon and <laughs> itunes all that kind of new download stuff which uh i'm getting to grips with now but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I would love to have been in a position to, to have my album on is it, vinyl. Is it on Spotify? It's on, uh, I don't know, I'll have to find out. Because you I, could be earning pennies from that. Right, well, I, <laughs> I, 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 have, I have retained Big Country's ex-manager as my manager. And, oh, okay. Um, you know, he's, and he's such a, a fantastic guy. We've, he's, he's managed Stranglers, Hazel O'Connor, the members, and he's had a great track record, and he also managed the cult for a while. Oh, so, you know, <laughs> I've retained his services and hopefully, you know, with the next album, and if my medical problems ease up, I'll be out there. Excellent. Well, uh, download um, Tony's album. My oh. time. That's right. Um, it's really has been a pleasure. Real pleasure. Thank you. And I look forward to uh, playing this. I look forward to him playing that. <laughs> Cheerio.